Okay. So we were talking about feedback control, right? And here was our little canonical example. And so a problem like this where the goal is to mix two streams to get some desired composition coming <coughs> out. You have one stream here that you have no control over in terms of its flow and composition. And then you have another stream that, so that, that's a binary stream, let's say. You have another stream that's pure component A, or whatever you might want to call the first component. Um, and so what we're going to do in this kind of setup is we're going to measure the composition of the outlet stream here. We're going to send that information to a controller. We're going to compare that measurement to the desired value of the composition, the mass fraction, or whatever you want to call it, um, which is called the set point. And then this controller will do a calculation and then send a signal to this valve. And I mentioned last time, this is a converter. It converts an electrical signal to a pneumatic signal. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. I'm introducing at this point what type of algorithms might be in this little circle here that translates um, this measurement to the output of the controller. Okay. So, oh, I don't have that part in there. Question. Air pressure. So when you guys go to the lab, you'll have experiments. The heat exchange may be the best example, but the pH one is another one, and the column is one. You'll have valves on the experiment. Those valves are driven by air pressure. So the controller actually sends an air pressure signal to open and close the valve. Okay. So in any plant or in the lab itself, you have to have a source of pressurized air to drive all the valves. Okay. And so um, that's just the way valves work. They work on pneumatic. They're driven up and down by pressure signals, actual air pressure. Okay. All right, so this is the kind of thing we're talking about. And last time, I, I'm going to go through this quickly. I introduced this, the proportional controller, right? This controller takes the difference between the desired value of the output and the measured value generates an air signal and then operates on this with a gain. So the output of the controller is nothing but a gain that you have to choose called the controller gain times this air signal and uh, it has this bias value as well. So the idea behind this is that if the air is big, the controller should do a lot. If the air is small, the controller shouldn't do much. I have to teach you later in the course how to pick this value. But I did try to convince you via a couple of examples. You can usually figure out what the sign of this thing is so the controller at least goes in the right direction. Okay. That was the first thing. And then I subsequently came down here and told you, we, this is the time domain representation, and then this, let's say here, is the equivalent of Laplace domain representation of the PI controller, so, or sorry, P controller. P means proportional. So by telling you have a proportional controller, you can feel free to use that equation, or you can feel free to use that equation. It just depends if you're working in time domain or Laplace domain. Okay. Then we said one problem with the proportional control is it doesn't eliminate offset. So, if you have a situation like this, here's your output versus time. This thing is your set point, the desired value. Let's say you change it like this from one value to another. If you don't have, if you only have a proportional controller, you might see something like this. <coughs> so it doesn't actually get there to the desired value. And this kind of thing is off, called offset, and it's quite. Um, undesirable for operations people with. Because all they do is monitor whether the plant's operating well when they see this, this desired temperature as, you know, 230 degrees and the actual temperature 210 degrees, they'll assume the controller's not working and that usually means they'll shut the controller off. Okay. So you don't usually have proportional control. It could be okay in some situations, but for the most part not. So, so we decided we should add interval control to the controller. So this was just integral control alone. So the nice thing about integral control, well, I should say, the nice thing about proportional control is that the output will, I should actually draw this too. So the controller is changing, at this point we call it P, right? That's the signal being sent um, to the valve, let's say. So if you change the desired value of the output like this, then this will be here. And then the controller is going to generate some signal here that tries to drive the output from this point to this point. Okay. And I told you last time, you can think of control as, as trying to move the variability from Y over to the peak. 
this is something you consider important, and this is something you don't consider. Yeah. Um, can, can you just uh, say again what the difference is between GC and the regular G for transfer function? GC is the transfer function of the controller. Right. Okay. And G is the transfer function of the process. So we go back to this picture here. G is a transfer function of this, of the tank. And GC would just be a transfer function representing what's right there. At this point, you shouldn't have a great understanding of GC. But we derive transfer functions, right? I told you the main part of the first third of the course is deriving transfer functions using the compute responses. And um, all those transfer functions were of the G, the process transfer function. Now we're introducing a new transfer function, which is that of the controller, we call it GC. <coughs> You'll get it. All right. Okay, so the good thing about proportional control is that the controller acts pretty quickly. The bad thing about proportional control is it doesn't act completely. Okay, so that's not ideal. Yeah. I don't know if you said that yet, but why does why is there offset? Why doesn't it act completely? Well, there's no. So if we look at this equation. There's no guarantee that this equation is going to lead to a P that makes the error equal to zero. So how to best explain that? The best way to explain it is show you the integral control does it. Let me explain how my integral control works, and then you might understand why if you don't have it, it's not going to work. So let me give it. All right. So, so the good thing about proportional control is it acts quickly, but it kind of doesn't complete the job. Okay. If you were to look at an integral controller, meaning a controller that looks like this thing here. It's a pure integral controller. So instead of the output of the controller being proportional to the air, it's proportional to the integral of the air. Okay, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Okay, so I'll come back to your question in a second. But So what's the good thing about this is that it's going to remove this offset. Okay. The bad thing is it tends to be very slow by itself. So. If I were to plot the output here for an integral only controller versus time, and you had a set point change that looked like that, you change your desired value, then the integral controller would have a tendency to look like this. Like it would get there, but it would get there like really, really slowly. Okay. So the idea of what we call PI control, proportional integral control, is combine the fact that this acts quickly with the fact that this acts completely at the end, and put them together and get the best of both worlds. Okay. So the, then the question was, why does this integral control work? Okay. Well, if you look at this equation here, you can see that this thing is going to be proportional to the integral of the air. That means if the air keeps changing, right, you're integrating under the curve. So <coughs> you plot in, let's say, the air versus time. This integral is nothing but the area under the curve. So let's say, or area under the curve. So let's say that's zero. Okay. The controller is going to keep changing the p until finally that that area is constant, right? Because you can see from the equation that as long as e is not constant, this integral will keep accumulating a value and it'll keep changing p. The only time p is going to change is when that integral assumes a constant value. That means the air itself goes to zero. And if you don't have integral control, it doesn't do that. So that's why a proportional only controller doesn't work. So, so this is like you like some things about proportional control, some things about integral control. They both have weaknesses, so that maybe we should put them together. Okay. And this is the most common form of um, control in the world, I would say, CI control. So it involves a proportional part. So if we look at the output of the controller, it's proportional to the air, it's also proportional to the integral of the air. The controller has two tuning parameters. One is the controller gain. The way most controllers are written is that controller gain will multiply both the proportional part and the integral part. And then you have something called the integral time. It's a measure of how much you weight the integral part. So obviously, if you want a big weighting on the integral term, you make tau i small. Right? If you want a big weighting on the proportional part, you make um, Kc large. Kc will also affect this, but you can always change tau c to whatever you want, tau i. Okay. So you have the bias term, but proportional integral, so we call that pi control. Um, and I think, you know, we did the, this is the last slide we did last time. 
so I won't go over this in great detail, but you can take this equation, apply the Laplace transform to this, and find that this is the corresponding. So there's the time domain equation, there's the Laplace domain equation. So the idea is once you start working with Laplace transforms, and if I were to tell you this is a PI controller, right, you should be able to say, uh, that's the proportional part, right, because I can see there's just the one that is a proportional error. One over S means integration, so that means proportional to the integral. So proportional part just generates that, but the integral part generates the one over S. Right? So one over S means integration. Okay. So this, this plot here is a little bit fictitious, because um, what it depicts is if your air signal were to go from zero to one and remain there, what would the controller do? Obviously, the controller is working, the air won't remain at one, right? It will really come back down. But it's meant to say, so what's going to happen? As soon as the controller sees this change, right? Why would this change occur? Because the air signal here is fine to be this, right? The set point is our value minus, let's say, the measurement. Let's say the air is zero, and all of a sudden I change this value. That will cre create a sudden increase in V, right? Because you all of a sudden have a big air. It would look something like this. Then the controller is going to immediately respond. It's going to have a quick response that's proportional to the proportional part. This is the proportional part of the controller. And then it's going to have a slower response that has to do with the integral part. So this is just meant to say what I already said verbally. If you put these two together, you get the benefits of having a fast response due to the proportional control, and then you have a slower, but it will complete the job um, from the integral part. And at the end of the lecture, I'll show you what these different controllers look like in more detail. Okay. So if you were to go into industry, you will find that, I don't know, 85 or 90 percent of the controllers are this, basically this equation of some variant there. So it's very important to learn about PI control, and we will spend time um, talking about it. Okay, so that's where we left off. This is the disadvantage of not finishing lectures. You always spend the first 10 minutes reviewing, and then you get further behind. It's just a, it's a real quagmire. But anyway, all right. So now, so you might say, okay, so now we've got everything that we, we need, right? And the answer is, I think so, but many people the, the generic term is called PID control, proportional, check, integral, check, and derivative. The con some people like to use derivative in, in the controller. I'll explain to you why I don't like derivative control, but first I'll explain what it is. Okay. So it's not um, rocket science from the standpoint, if, if I say it's a derivative control, there's a good chance that the controller output is proportional to the derivative <coughs> of the air. Right. Proportional, proportional to the air, integral, proportional to the integral of the air, now proportional to the derivative of the air. And you have a, a weighting factor or tuning parameter called tau t at the derivative of time. It don't have units of time. Minutes, hours, seconds, whatever. Okay. All right. So why do we want to even have such a term in there, right? The idea here is stated in the first thing is that in principle, this part of the controller would allow you to anticipate where the air signal is going. So for example, if you have an air signal that's increasing with time, <coughs> then a logical conclusion is to conclude that it's going to keep increasing with time, at least for the short term, right? And so by having a term that's proportional to the air, you can have sensitivity to how fast the air is changing, right? So if the air is increasing quickly, you should do a lot. That's the reason for this. So it's proportional to the rate of change of the air, not just the air itself. Okay, and I'll explain to you the limitations of this in a moment. But So that's the idea. You can have something proportional. These guys explain why they're leaving. I'm not totally sure I buy their explanation, but um, <laughs> they did tell me they were leaving. I'm going to have to talk to Sarley about this. I shouldn't be calling people out in the middle of class to go to an, from one class to go talk to. But anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there, right? All right, so here we go. So proportional now to the derivative of the air, and same kind of thing we can do here is that if you <coughs> find a Laplace transform of this, you can take the P prime, excuse me, P bar over here, we call it P prime, right? P minus P bar. You have this equation, now you can take the Laplace transform of this equation, this just becomes P prime of S, 
you get tau d negative, take them across, transform of that, and derivative terms yield s. <coughs> Integral terms lead, yield 1 over s. Derivative terms yield, you've seen this, right? When you take the Laplace transform differential equations. So <coughs> this thing here will yield s times the Laplace of e. Okay? And obviously, you could write it like this, or sometimes we like to write it in this form. So this would be the input of the controller, which is the air signal, and the output of the controller is the signal sent to the valve, so that's why we write it this way. We call that transfer function of GC. It's the transfer function of the controller, not to be confused with the transfer function of the process, and it would just be tau ds, okay? Um, with exceptions that are outside the realm of process, chemical process control, like in robotics or something, you might use derivative control itself, but we never do. So at this point, you can see a trend. Introduce a mode of control, add it to the modes you've already had. So proportional, you get integral, add it to proportional. Guess what? You get derivative, add it to integral and proportional. Okay. That's why they call this the PID, P-I-D. So if we look at this equation, it's just everything put together. The proportional term, which you can adjust with KC, the integral term, which you can adjust with this tau i, and the derivative term, which you can adjust with tau d. And based on the fact that we found the Laplace transform of every one of these terms individually, and including the PI, you just add the P, you can just add what, we did this already for a PI controller, now you can just add the derivative part, and you'll see this is the transfer function of the PID controller. Okay. That's the proportional part, that's the integral part, and that's the derivative part. Okay, so here's a little picture if you want to represent this as a kind of block diagram. So you have the air signal coming in, because that's the input to the controller. It goes through the proportional part, the integral part, the derivative part. You add all these signals together, that's what this means. You also, if you've been doing it in the homework, you notice you have something that looks just like this in Signalink as well. <coughs> this, just, this just represents that we add all three of these signals together to get this signal. That signal is multiplied by Kc, right? And then you get the output of the control. Okay. So that is equivalent to that, which is equivalent to that. So this Okay, so what do I not like about PID control? I don't like the D part, typically. So this is, um, I'm not trying to be discriminatory. Just, um, so what's the problem here? Because if you go to lab, so here's what happens in lab, right? As soon as you guys get a control project, the group usually comes and talks to me, and they said, we, we have to build a PID controller, and I would say, just build a PI controller, forget the derivative part. And then Connor gets really mad. He, he, for some reason, he likes derivative control, but I'm not sure he knows why he likes it. Okay. Um, so the, pro the problem with derivative control is if you look at that signal, it says take the derivative of the air. Right? And so you should know that integration is a smoothing operation, right? If you have kind of a noisy signal E, integrating it will smooth it out. Unfortunately, differentiation is the opposite. It, it accentuates any noise that might be in the signal. So if you have a noisy signal E, the derivative of the E is going to be incredibly noisy. Right? Because you're taking the slope. So, and the problem is, this is an extremely serious eraser. Right? <laughs> the problem is, real signals are not smooth. Right? They tend to be noisy. So, if you were to have and why is the signal noisy? Well, the, this is not noisy, because you choose this, this is a value you choose. But this measurement is noisy, right? Because it comes from a thermocouple or a flow meter or something. And therefore, if you plot the air signal versus time, you know, it might you know, wander around like this, whatever. Okay? So you're like, okay, I'm going to take the derivative of that. like that maybe. So my experience is that the benefits of derivative control are usually outweighed by the by the negative aspects of derivative control. Okay. So it is true it does get you this anticipatory capability that isn't there otherwise. But unless your signal is really nice, it tends to make the behavior of the controller not so nice. And therefore what you usually end up doing is taking this tau D to be pretty small because you don't want to weight this kind of noise very much. So my experience, which is pretty extensive, is that you can almost always do without derivative control. Okay. So if I was a practicing engineer, 
and I, I wouldn't even worry about the derivative part. Even though, you know, some people use it, but it's, just, it's not, the critical part is the P and the I. You might use this, you might not, but if you have noise, you're not going to want to use it. Okay. So, if you do want to use the derivative um, control in the controller, meaning you want to include the last term, hopefully you can appreciate that this might be a bit of a problem, even if the signal's not noisy. Because let's say I do this, right? I have this air signal that looks like this. I change this suddenly. Right? If I change this suddenly, the air signal's going to have an infinite slope. Do you agree? Because all of a sudden it went from zero, maybe, up to some value, because I changed this at some fixed time. So the derivative is infinite. That's not very good. That's not good news. Right? So this thing will, this thing will ha assume a huge value. And that's not good, because that will generate a huge controller input. And that'll like slam the valve open or close, and this is not desirable. So, one thing you can do, I always think this sounds like a, you guys are too young to know this, but 1980s hair band, you know what a hair band is? This sounds like the name of a hair band, derivative hair. Okay. Oh, anyway. <laughs> so, what, what you're doing here is you're just you're taking out um, the set point here. Because you got to remember that the goal of the derivative part is to anticipate where the measurement's going. So, you can, you can still anticipate where things are going by um, eliminating this from that term. Okay? So then you're just taking the derivative of y, the measurement, and you'll still get an idea if that's going up or down. Okay? So that'll get rid of that. Okay, fine. So here, this is just some kind of, this is terminology. Okay? So the slide is just kind of general uh, notation, if you will. So if somebody tells you a controller is reverse acting, what they're telling you is that the controller gain is positive. That may seem weird, because you might say that should be called direct action, not reverse. Well, the reason this is called this is because, because the air looks like this, okay? So if the output increases, then this, let's say this thing is, the set point's larger than this. Then you increase the, the measurement increases then this arrow will get smaller, and the controller output will go smaller. So in some sense, Y went up, but the signal from the controller went down. Because it's minus the measurement. Okay? So that's why they call it reverse acting. Measurement increases, controller decreases the, um, the output. Of it, of its output. Yeah, that's what I said. All right. Okay. Um, direct action is just the opposite. It means the controller gain is negative. So I tend not to use these terms. I'll just tell you the gain is positive or negative. But um, you'll see this in a different context, and so that's what it means. OK. Here's an important thing to remember for the rest of your life. Let's say you don't know what sign the controller gain should be, okay? but you know what the process gain So at this point, it becomes very important to distinguish between the controller and the process. Okay. Controller transfer function is called G sub C. Process transfer function is G of S. They're two different things. This is the dynamics, inherent dynamics of the process. This is the, the control algorithm, not to be confused with each other. Okay. Okay. Now here's something I probably haven't taught you. Let's say you want to find the gain of these two, right? So every transfer function has a gain, except for an integrator. So one thing you can do is put it in one of the standard forms. Remember the first order and second order standard forms, and then the numerator is the k. And obviously, if you have in that form, the gain is the k in the numerator. But if you just have any arbitrary transfer function, you can do the following. You can take your process transfer function, plug in s equals 0, and what you get back is the gain of the process. And it doesn't matter how you've written d. It doesn't have to be a standard form to get any form you want. <coughs> So it's a convenient way to find the gain without having to do a bunch of rearrangement, if that was necessary. You can do the same thing with the controller gain, by the way. Um, well, let's not go there yet. The problem with this eraser is you can't really tell what the front and back are. All right. So rather than do that, because that, that gets a little bit more complex, and the reason here is that if you were to plug in s equals 0 here, you got a problem here. right? I do agree that if I were to try to compute s of g of 0, this would be a bit of a problem because I would have to divide by 0. So let's just say 
you're trying to figure out what the sign of the controller gain is. You know the process gain. If you don't know it, you can find it like this. And the key thing here is that this, all, this always has to be true. If the process gain is positive, the controller gain should be positive. If the process gain is negative, then the controller gain should be negative. Okay. So in other words, to figure out what the sign of the controller gain should be, the sign, okay, just figure out the, what the sign of the process gain is. It's, it's that simple. Um, so now your search for an appropriate value of KC is limited to a semi-infinite domain. It's still big, right? It's like zero to infinity or minus infinity to zero. <laughs> so you still don't know a good value, but at least you know it should be positive or negative. If this thing is the wrong sign, then you do the wrong thing. So, for example, if you go back to the... Sorry to flip back here because I know you guys hate that. But I can't help it in this case. If you have the wrong controller gain in this controller, what is it going to do? It's going to say, ah, I need, let's say this stream does not have enough of the component A in it, and this is pure A. So this doesn't have enough A in it, so if the thing's the wrong gain, this will reduce the flow here of A. Then there'll be even less A. And then you'll see less A, and it will reduce it further until finally this stream is shut off completely. So anytime you're in the lab and your controller does something like that, like it just slowly moves and closes the valve and stays there, or opens the valve and stays, there's a good chance your controller gains the wrong sign. Okay. All right, back to wherever I was. Okay, cool. So this just shows you the two scenarios, right? So this is a situation where the air increases and you increase the output of the controller. That's this case. The second case is this one. Air gets larger, you reduce the output of the controller. It's, it's just process dependent. All right. Here's another... Um, bit of terminology. If someone tells you the controller is an automatic, it means it's turned on. It's, it's working. It's doing something. If they tell you the controller is in manual, it means the controller has been turned off. Okay. So the problem that you see, if, and someone did a study of this, I forget, I think it was DuPont. They went to a bunch of companies and asked them, of all the controllers you have in a plant, how many are usually turned on versus turned off? And it was something like 75 percent are turned, but 25 percent are routinely turned off. And that should, that's not very impressive. Right? So 75 percent of the things you've designed are used and 25 percent aren't because they're not working. So what happens is that, two things, is that if you have a controller and it doesn't appear to be working for the operations people to monitor the plant, they just turn it off. And they just can control, because they can control the plant themselves. So if they feel like your controller isn't doing what it should do, then they just turn it off. And sometimes the control engineer turns them off because they just don't have time or desire to fix them. And so the conclusion is, we'll just turn those things off and worry about doing it manually because it's not critical. Okay. So you could argue the basic, uh, basic um, measure of how well you're doing in controls, how many controllers are turned on versus how many are turned off. 100% of the controllers are turned on, that's a good sign that the control system is working properly. All right. Um, so these just give us some, some plots so you can conceptually see what's happening. So let, here's the scenario. Here's the output versus time. Okay? What, what happened here? At time equals zero, there's some disturbance. The okay, disturbance pushes the output away from the set point. The set point is zero because we're dealing with deviation variables. So the desired value is zero. It's at zero initially, and then some disturbance comes in and pushes the output away from the set point. Okay? And so the goal of the controller is to, to try to take this output and drive it back to zero. So this is these are conceptual pictures, right? So here's if you have no control, you might get this situation. That's not good, right? Because now the output is a long ways away. Because you have no control, there's no way to compensate for disturbances. This is really trashing proportional control. But if you had proportional control, maybe you would do you would do better, but it would usually look more down here. It's not that bad. But, uh, okay. Um, but you can see this isn't going to generally take the output or return it back to the set point, so that's not good. In principle, if you have PI control, you might have something that looks like this. Okay? So it responds pretty quickly, but it oscillates. Now, if I saw a this is what's called the closed loop response. Okay? This means this is the response of the system with the controller connected up to the plant and working. If I were to see this right here, this PI response, this oscillatory thing, I would say that's, that's too oscillatory. Like, if you're, an, if you're a plant operator and you see stuff like this, it's not a big stretch of faith to think this could eventually grow, right? This is like too oscillatory. I might come back tomorrow and it might look more like this. Okay. 
So usually you don't allow this to occur, but again, this is conceptual. I just want to, don't want to leave you with the idea that this looks okay. It doesn't actually look okay. But they did this for a reason, and the reason is they wanted to they wanted to show you that the derivative control can have a stabilizing effect. So when you've done this is P only, then you added I and got this, now you added D, and now you got something that looks a little more stable, less oscillatory. Okay. Um, as we'll see, these responses depend on the parameters of the controller, the, the KC, the tau I, and tau D. And this PI one is just badly tuned. It's still oscillatory, I'll teach you how to do it. Okay. Um, this shows the effects of the particular parameters. So if you have a proportional only controller, okay, and you have no control, that corresponds to Kc equals zero. Is that right? Because you have this equation that looks like P of T is P bar plus Kc times the air signal. Right? If Kc is zero, that just means it's equal P bar. You don't change the output. You don't, you're not doing anything. Okay. That means you're just leaving the valve at a constant position or something like that. Then you get something like I just showed you. Disturbance affects you at time equals zero. Pushes the output way away from the set point. You don't do anything about it. Okay. If you increase the Kc, it'll, this amount of offset here, right, which is the difference between where you end up and where you'd like to be, gets smaller and smaller. So you might think to yourself, why not just crank Kc up to a really high value then? And the problem is, if you crank Kc too far up, you'll start seeing behavior that looks like this. So it, it will start getting closer and closer, but it'll start oscillating. At some point, it will go unstable, meaning you might get a response that looks like that. Okay. So you can't fix this offset problem by just cranking up the gain to an arbitrarily large value. Okay. All right. <coughs> so that's proportional control only. And then these two, these three plots are PID all put together. And it's just trying to show you what happens for each one of the parameters when you change them. So the way to view these three is you have a PID controller operating, and now you're going to move KC around, or tau I around, or tau D. So again, if you have a PID controller, it's going to get rid of offset. You have some KC. This would be a fairly small value of KC. If you keep increasing it, it'll look better, potentially, up until a point. And then at this point, it'll start cycling like that. So we'll see that how you tune these things is kind of a, both a science and an art. Okay. But if someone asks me, is that value good too slow? How about that value? Too slow. How about that value? Pretty good. Okay. It's like it's like art, right? Like when I visit Europe and you go to a famous art gallery, you don't know what piece of art you're supposed to be impressed by. I don't know if you've ever been to a place like this, right? So you find out, you get like a tourist group maybe of Japanese people, they're all standing around one piece and you're like, that's the most beautiful piece of art. You've ever seen. Right. So, that's what I'm telling you about this. This is this is more beautiful than that one. I, I know. All right. So the effect of tau i is opposite, right? Because the weighting term is 1 over tau i. So this is increasing tau i, which means if you increase tau i, the weighting on the interval part gets less, because it's 1 over tau i. And so if tau i is relatively uh, big, you get something that looks like a little bit too slow. And you can increase it, it will get faster. And eventually, if you, if you decrease it, I should say, it will get too small, and then you'll start seeing the cycle of behavior. So if someone asked me which one I prefer here, I would, I would take this one. That one's too slow, that one's too slow. Finally, derivative one, as you increase the derivative part, you can see something like this. If um, the derivative, so this is pretty idealistic. I've got news for you. It says, if you increase the derivative term, you can kind of damp out these oscillations. So in other words, the bigger the D is, the more stable the controller is. And that's true if the controller, if the signal